Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. Well, Jesus speaking to a highly regarded and respected uh, leader of the Jews told him, Nick, you must be born again. All of this that you have, man, it's supposed to lead you to me. All the law and all the prophets point to Jesus. The ceremonies and the sacrifices in the tabernacle and later the temple point to Jesus. It was, is, and will always be about Jesus. In today's broadcast, we have part two of Pastor Sam's message, A Christ-Like Christian. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 15, and we're going to take up in verse 13. Herein, Paul is dealing with those Jews who are struggling with Gentiles having access to God's promises, or at least seeing them as needing to be under the law before they can have access to God's promises. Well, we might think it's not an issue our church deals with today, but we do face it in many different ways. So let's listen in. Here's the nature of the rift. Not an issue most of us will deal with, but uh, in their particular time in history and fellowship, the rift was over. Does a Christian who's a Gentile in background need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to really fulfill the call and plan and purpose that God has for his or her life? And, and uh, of course, the, you know, the, the, the thing for the Jews was you need to really become Jewish even though you're already Christian. And they actually had a huge council. It's recorded for us in Acts 15. You should look at it later, familiarize yourself with it, because they settled once and for all this issue. No, it's not about Christians becoming more Jewish, or, or certainly not about Jews becoming more carnal and pagan. It's about each becoming Christian. And in Christ, those distinctions are no longer the issue. There will be advantages on this side, and... Uh, I don't see a lot of advantages on our side. If you're Gentile persuasion as I am, I'm not sure that we were ever better off. But but I do know this. God loved Jew and Gentile. And for them, understand, that's all there was. There was the Jew and there was the Gentile. There was the Jew and then the pagan. That's, That's how they saw the Gentiles. And so God reached out to those who had the law, who had circumcision, who who had the feast and the festivals and the priesthood and the temple and the services and all of that stuff. And he said, well, Jesus speaking to a highly regarded and respected uh, leader of the Jews told him, Nick, you must be born again. All of this that you have, man, it's supposed to lead you to me. All the law and all the prophets point to Jesus. The ceremonies and the sacrifices in the tabernacle and later the temple point to Jesus. It was, is, and will always be about Jesus. And so I have Jewish friends who become Christians and and they're like, you guys really need to pay more attention to the law. You need to pay more attention to the Sabbath. And, and, and you know, you're not really. And, and, and I'm thinking, wait, I think I've read something about this. And I don't want to get in an argument with them because the servant of the Lord mustn't quarrel. And I realize in that scenario... They're the weaker brother. That, that I don't want to stumble them, but, but at the same time, God tells them not to be judging me. I'm free in Christ. I don't have to only worship on this day or go to this place or do this or offer this sacrifice. All that has been done for us and fulfilled in Jesus. Well, he continues, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, verse 13, in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. that The the next picture, beyond like-minded, caring for one another, lovingly accepting one another, he says we need to be filled with His Holy Spirit. We need to be overflowing joy and peace. How do I know He means overflowing? Because when God fills us, it's never to the brim. It's always to overflowing. In fact... If somebody's frustrated and angry and hostile and you bump into them, do they let you know that they're not happy? Oh, yeah. It's immediate. In fact, if you're wise, you see it coming and you don't even bump into them. But, but here's the point. If somebody's just filled with joy and they're filled with peace and, and, and just loving God and loving people and you bump into them and they're like, oh, sorry, they're like, oh, no problem, bro. How are you, by the way? Is everything, can I get you something, you know? 
because it's what I'm full of is going to overflow my life. And so he's saying, may the God of hope fill us. And he means to overflowing with the joy and the peace that come from this new relationship, from believing in him, the hope we have by the power of the Holy Spirit. I found in my own personal walk and experience that joy and peace, they're like spiritual thermometers. And as soon as I'm not right, and that's easy for me, I, 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 I lose my joy and I lose my peace. I remember Damien Kyle, somebody asked him once, it's like, do you ever wake up grumpy in the morning? And he said, no, I usually let her sleep in. I saw him in a discussion with his wife later on. She was doing most of the talking. But uh, in any case, sometimes I wake up a little grumpy. I just do. There's no explaining it. There's no excusing it. I know I'm not the only one. But I know I need to make a quick and immediate adjustment to my attitude. And, and usually that just means saying, Lord, I just don't feel right. And I'm pretty sure that that Pam doesn't need anything that's going to spill out of me if this is the way I'm feeling. So would you just fill me with the joy and the peace that only comes from knowing I'm right with you. And, and listen, it's a simple and a heartfelt prayer. We'll see when we get to the end of this study that Paul says, hey, pray with me and pray for me. Nothing weird about that because Paul's saying, pray that God would protect me and use me and, and, and that he'd be glorified through me. But the picture again is, Whatever I'm full of, if I'm just filled with the peace of God, then, well, she can't make me mad, or he can't aggravate me, or that person can't get on my nerves. Or, But you ever use language like that? He makes me so mad. Really, he has that much control over you. That's scary. Because the reality is, if you're at peace, you're at peace. Jesus promised a peace that the world couldn't even understand or know. And man, that is available to us 24-7. I have peace with God because of the blood Jesus shed for me. I have the peace from God because I'm, I'm walking with and abiding in Him. And I can have peace even with my enemies if I realize I'm here to represent the Lord, not to, to teach them a thing or two or give them a lesson or, 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 or whatever it might be. Give them a piece of my mind. All the foolish things I used to think and say before He began to transform me. Well, Paul goes on to say in verse 14, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. And again, the picture is overflowing with goodness and knowledge. Listen, goodness here is virtue demonstrated by generosity. Practical care for one another. It's what Jesus was trying to say and said so well when he said by this all men will know you're my disciples that you have love for one another why the kind of love he's talking about is observable it's demonstrable he's merciful so when i show mercy people are going to look and say wow i don't really see that that often when i'm kind and, and patient and long suffering and forgiving well we're living in a world that that's not really the norm so the very things that he says will be our, our, our new attitudes and our new attributes, our new virtues, if you will, they're going to they're gonna bear witness that we truly are transformed people. We are Christ-like Christians, not Christians in name only, not cultural Christians or Christians by default, but Christ-like Christians. If goodness is virtue demonstrated by generosity... Knowledge here speaks to an experiential knowledge of and an intimate relationship with the Lord. You know, there are people who have an intuitive knowledge of God. In fact, God says he is, he's put eternity in the hearts of men. So, so men are always like, well, there has to be something. And, 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 you know, they could say, well, I think probably not this or maybe this. And so amazing in, and again in a country that claims to mostly be Christian how many varied opinions there are as to what he, that even means but but if I have an experience with the Lord I'm overflowing that experience so like you I find a need to ask for forgiveness do you know that in the Lord's Prayer where he said 
that, that we're to, you know, forgive as we're forgiven and, and we're to pray for our daily bread. He puts a lot of the things that, that we think we might need now and then in the context of pretty regular. And one of those is forgiveness. And, and the more I'm, I'm operating the way he intends, if I'm walking in the light as he is in the light, he says, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ cleanses me from all sins. I did a word study on that. I was blown away to find out that it meant continually cleanses. I thought it was going to say, well, if I'm walking in the light as he is in the light, well, then his blood has cleansed me from all sin. And somehow the translation got mixed up. But no, it's saying there's a continual cleansing, which suggests if I'm walking in the light, I won't be sinless. I will sin less, but I'll still be readily and immediately confessing when I do sin. So it'll be like, Lord, forgive me. And then when somebody offends me, I'm like, whether they ask for it or not, Lord, you're extending your grace to me, your mercy, your forgiveness. I'm going to extend that to them. And especially if they ask, well, there's no way you're going to hold that back. So goodness overflowing. Knowledge, this experiential knowledge, not just a knowledge of God, but a knowledge, well, an experience with God. And then he says we are able to admonish one another. That word able is actually the word from which we get our word dynamite or dynamic. He's saying we have the power. We have what it takes to admonish one another, to impart understanding, to impart through teaching, to, to warn and, and direct and correct and encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. He has enabled us by his spirit. That's the dynamic, you see. He's the dynamic. So we can encourage and teach and build up one another. Nevertheless, he says in verse 15, Brethren, I've written more boldly to some of you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God. As he did a bit earlier, and we'll get through this next section a little more quickly, he's going to focus on two things, the Gentiles and the gospel, the Gentiles and the gospel. And here's the irony. We would have thought Paul would be perfectly suited to bring the good news of the gospel that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again, to his Jewish brethren. Why? He was a scholar. He was a Pharisee. He was regarded. He was respected. He'd been schooled by the the most respected teachers of his day. And, and so Paul even thought, well, this is a no-brainer. I'm one of them. I'll go to them. They'll listen to me. And God says, no, that's not the plan. And like, what is the plan? Well, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. When we get into the next book, 1 Corinthians, here's what he has to say. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because all of that knowledge, all of the insight, all of the, the understanding, it wasn't going to help him reach a Gentile group that just needed to know God made them, their sin was separating them, and Jesus died for them. Shed his blood, died, rose again the third day, and offered him forgiveness and pardon of sin. Now, did all that theological training, did all that, that understanding of the Old Testament go to waste? Not at all. Because Paul is the primary writer of the New Testament. Once we're past the Gospels and the book of Acts, most of the rest of the New Testament was written by Paul in conjunction, of course, with God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But, but my point is this. God was going to use Paul to write about those things that wouldn't benefit him in bringing the Gospel to a, a group that knew nothing about the Old Testament. And all they needed to know is, Hey, God made you, and God loves you, and he has a plan to deal with your sin. And that plan is his son, Jesus, and his suffering, and bloodshed, and death for you. Well, that's what Paul's ministry was, and he, and he says, this is where I'm at. I want to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. Paul's just saying, listen, the Gentiles were reaching out for God. I brought them the message from God. And everything that happened, 
it was God at work. He confirmed the word with mighty signs and wonders, verse 19, the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem and round about Ulrichium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now the gospel of God, verse 16, the gospel of Christ, here in verse 19, it's the same gospel. There's only one good news. And, and, and all he's saying is this is the gospel that the Father gave me to preach, the gospel of the Son, Jesus, who died for our sins. That's what it means that he's the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. So I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. His heart preached the gospel to his brethren, preached the gospel to the Gentiles. He said he became all things to all men that he might by all means save some. He, he wasn't under the illusion that, that everyone was going to get saved. But he did know everyone was going to have a chance to hear about their Savior. Everyone he had opportunity to come in contact with. That's why Paul can say things, and he uses that word here, minister. I'm a minister of Jesus Christ. Elsewhere, he calls himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And he writes from prison, and he says, a, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He knew wherever he was, Jesus had him there, and Jesus would use him there. So if they chained him between two soldiers, which was their habit when he was imprisoned, well, he's like, hey, have I told you my story? And then he told them the story. I mean, he had the captive audience. They couldn't get away. And when he was free, he was free to preach. And, and you know, that's what he did. When he was bound, he was, he was bound to preach. And that's what he did. But the point is, Paul didn't let anything stop him from fulfilling the call on his life. And so God confirmed it, moved miraculously. He demonstrated that the words were true. And by the way, don't ever think, well, if only God would do this or God would do that, then everyone would believe. You know, there, there, there was someone who said, uh, hey, if, if you'll just sin, it's the story of Lazarus and the rich man. You should check it out later. But if you, I've got some brothers back there and I don't want them to end up here. And if you'll just someone, send someone back from the dead, uh, then, then, you know, they'll believe. Just raise someone from the dead. That'll do it, Lord, for sure. And, 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 or, you know, and, and here's the problem with that there's a guy named Lazarus who actually was raised from the dead by Jesus. Did all the unbelievers believe? Did the religious leaders say, well, he's got to be the Messiah. He just raised the dead. No, they said, we've got to get rid of him. And now we're going to have to get rid of him too. We can't have this dead guy walking around saying Jesus raises the dead. When they let the man down through, through the roof and, and, and Jesus looked at him and said, Sons, your sins are forgiven. And there was this uproar in the room. Everyone started murmuring. I like that word. It sounds just like what it is. Murmur, murmur, murmur. You, you don't even have to use any other word. It just sounds like murmuring. But, but th they start murmuring, saying, Hey, only God can forgive sin. Exactly. And Jesus was God the Son. And that's what he was doing there. But he says, That you might know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I say, Rise take up your bed and walk. I share this with you for a simple reason. If you're thinking it would be more radical, more dramatic, more, you know, eye-opening, as it were, if Jesus were giving sight to the blind, which he can do, or, or giving the lame the ability to, to run and leap and walk, and, or, or, or raising the dead, he's saying that the primary issue of life is that our sins are forgiven. Why? All those other things are temporal. Forgiveness is eternal. Those things are physical. Forgiveness is spiritual. And, and, and so it's not to say he doesn't have a heart to do it or the power to do it. No, if, if you're in need, we pray, we trust him. He does what he decides. But his major issue, Jesus' major issue, was salvation. That's why he came to suffer and die for our sins. And Paul came to preach as a minister, a servant of Jesus Christ, serving the Gentiles, bringing the gospel. Well, that's exactly what he came to do. For this reason, verse 22, I've been much hindered from coming to you. For what reason? Busy fulfilling the call on his life, preaching the gospel. He wanted to see his friends in Rome. And by the way, you can read that into chapter 16. Paul had a lot of friends in Rome. We're going to see that next time as we conclude the book. But he says, I've wanted to come there, but I've been hindered. And no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, 
Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. Verse 24. For I hope to see you on my journey and be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Here is another mark of a Christ-like Christian. Not only the, the things that, that we saw in the introductory section, but, but this, this overwhelming generosity. The Gentile Christians knew that the Christians in Jerusalem were suffering. Lots of reasons for that. Not time today to go into it. But they decided, let's, let's take up offerings and let's just send them a love gift to help meet their needs down there. And Paul, well, he's gathering up that stuff and heading back to Jerusalem. And that's all he's saying. These guys love them because, well, they have been blessed by them. In fact, verse 27 makes that point. If please them indeed, and they are their debtors, if the Gentiles have been partakers of their, partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore... When I perform this and seal to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. Paul's plan, he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to go to Spain, and he's going to drop by Rome on the way. Now listen, that's God's plan too. Only Paul has no idea he'll be arrested in Jerusalem. He'll sit in a prison there, then he'll be taken to Caesarea, and he'll sit in a prison there. And then he'll be threatened numerous times and ultimately have to appeal to Caesar and will be transported at government expense, albeit as a slave on a slave ship, a condemned criminal, or potentially condemned criminal, at least in the eyes of his Jewish brethren. He'll be going to Rome, but, but, but all he knows now is, my heart's to be with you, and I'm planning to come to you. And, and it turns out, because that was God's will, that's going to happen. What if it wasn't God's will? Well, it wasn't going to happen, because Paul was committed to fulfill the will of God. Well, he, he says, I will come to you, verse 29, and when I come, I'll come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers and then to God for me. I mentioned this earlier. If you're one of those people that feels guilty praying for yourself, don't. Now, if you're just praying for stuff, well, then that's a problem. But if you're praying, bless me, bless me, bless me, don't bless them. Bless me, bless me. If you have anything extra, give it to them. That's a problem. But, but if you can pray like, like Paul, say, hey, pray with me and pray for me. What were his concerns? That I might be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. Primarily his own brethren who were turned against him because he was now a believer in Christ. And then he says, and that my service, my ministry for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. He wasn't saying, pray that I have an easy time or pray that, that, that you know, I have everything I want or everything I need or that I fulfill all my desires. No, pray that God would use me and that the brethren would accept me and that, that the, the, the others would be refreshed by me. That I may come, he says, verse 32, and we conclude with it that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. In Romans 2, 4, Paul asked an important question. He said, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Well, how would we despise the riches of God's goodness? Well, like Jonah, who hated the idea of God showing mercy to the Ninevites, some can find themselves thinking that some other people simply do not deserve God's grace. And this can play itself out by us thinking, well, there's no way that person could ever be saved. Or, like the Jews in our study today did, they try to put unrealistic burdens on them before they can be saved, saying, ah, the only way this person can be worthy for salvation is if they do it the same way that I did it. We have to know this is not God's heart. His heart is that all should come to salvation. Because once a person is born again, they're a new creation. And God doesn't look at the old man. He knows the new creation that that person will become. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico. And you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. 
You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.